Hello, and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals, the podcast that talks about conservation and cool animal facts. I'm Eric Mahan, and welcome. If this is your first time, thanks for checking out the podcast. And if you're returning, as always, welcome back. I got a great show ahead of you today, so let's get started with some environment news. First up, a lucky group of whale watchers got to watch a once in a lifetime experience. They were lucky enough to watch the birth of a rare gray whale off the coast of California. Many scientists believe that this is the first time this incredible experience was not just witnessed, but since they were a tourist, of course they had cameras, so even the first time it was captured on camera. On January 2nd, a few miles off the coast, a group of whale watchers spotted a lone female of about 40 to 50 feet or about 12 to 15 meters in length. Shortly after spotting the female, it started to act sporadically, and all of a sudden, a pool of blood appeared around her. At first, the onlookers became nervous, thinking the female whale was being attacked by a shark, until, pop, a baby whale appeared. If you ever wish to see this video, it was actually uploaded to YouTube to the DWWS channel. It shows the mother swimming alongside her new baby and helping bring her baby up to the surface to allow the exhausted baby to rest and breathe. The calf itself was about 15 feet or 4.5 meters in length. Also, pre-warning, if you watch this video, you may look at the baby whale calf and think to yourself, this thing doesn't look like it can survive or something must be wrong with it because the baby calf is actually really floppy looking. It doesn't look like it can even hold its little flippers or flukes up at this point. But don't worry, this is normal. When gray whales are born, their flukes and tails are born soft to help with the birthing process and won't become hard until 24 hours later. During this time, it's not really the best of swimmer and relies on mom to help out. But after 24 hours, it is pretty much ready to go. So once again, if you ever want to see this amazing once-in-a-lifetime video, just make sure to check out the YouTube video on the DWWS channel today. Next, another positive ocean story. Baby seals on the Norfolk coast have been seen in record numbers this year. Spotters have counted around 3,796 pup births this year, which is almost double the account for the winter of 2019 to 2020. Volunteers also have spotted around 1,169 adults on the coastline as well. This is a great sign not just for seals, but the seals are a good indicator on how the environment is doing because healthy seal populations mean a sign of a healthy fish population all currently in the North Sea. A fish population that is able to feed thousands of seals apparently. Every year between November and January, gray seals come ashore to breed in Norfolk, which is just one of a few spots found on the British coastline. But out of all of these, Norfolk is one of the most popular for these seals, with also roughly half of the world's population of gray seals being found in just the British coastline itself, making this area a very important area for the world's gray seals. The seal pups when first born will feed on the mother's milk for about three weeks, and from that nutritional milk, they will start to grow rapidly. After about three weeks, however, the mother will leave without their pups, for the pups have to shed their whitish fur and get a more ocean-capable fur available before joining their mothers in the ocean. It's sort of like being born with a big fluffy winter coat to help survive cold temps on land, but once it's time to grow up, it's time to get a wetsuit on because, yeah, that big fluffy winter coat isn't going to do you too well out living in the sea. And then lastly, lots of great ocean news this week. I, I didn't even attempt to do this, but a long-awaited win for sharks. President Biden signed into law the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act that was part of the National Defense Authorization Act. And if you don't know about politics in the United States and are a little confused why those two are matched up together, lots of weird stuff get matched up together, even if they have nothing to do with each other. But sometimes it's the only way to get things people think are less important passed. Not saying this concept is right or wrong. But yeah, that's just kind of how it goes over here. Ugh. Anyway, moving on all from politics, yuck. The Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act is a huge moment for conservation, which has banned the sales of commercial 
trade of shark fins and shark fin products, which, yeah, have shark fins in it, in the United States. Sharks are an extremely important part of the ocean ecosystem, which without could cause the collapse of multiple ecosystems, not just in the water, but even on land. It's estimated that 100 million sharks are killed each year worldwide simply for their fins to be used in a dish called shark fin soup. If that wasn't bad enough, a common practice for shark finning is people will catch the sharks, cut off their fins while the shark is still alive, and throw the live shark back into the ocean. For the sharks to either drown because they can't move to push water through their gills to breathe, starve because obviously they can't hunt, or get picked off by other predators. Shark populations around the world are decreasing, some as much as 90% due to shark fin trade. 17 states and three U.S. territories already had bans on shark fin trades, but a federal law has now covered the rest of the United States and its territories for the trade of shark fins. The finning process, however, was banned in the United States waters for some time now, but the sales for finning outside the United States to the United States was still allowed to happen. By the way, the ban for the shark fin trade has been in the works since 2016. Now, it is a huge win for sharks, but the sale of shark fin soup in the United States will most likely continue to happen even without shark fins, with a shark fin substitute, unfortunately, stingrays who are also severely under threat due to shark fin soup, but don't have the same protection that the sharks do. Which really does show, once again, new laws are great, but the best form of conservation will always be education and help change people's opinions while teaching people to care more about the environment than the things in their everyday life. Which is hard, especially for shark fin soup. It is a fairly big cultural thing for multiple Asian countries. How would you feel if someone tried to ban something important in your culture without talking to you first or even working with you to try and find a better solution? And that is your environment news. So for today's featured creature, we're going to be talking about a really amazing, unique species of frog, a species named after none other the father of modern biology and the creator of the theory of natural selection, Charles Darwin. For today, we talk about the Darwin's frog. Now, there are two species of Darwin's frog, the northern and southern Darwin's frog, and as you can imagine, one lives north of the other. The northern Darwin frog lives in northern Chile, while the southern Darwin frog lives in the southern Chile and Argentina area. For this episode, however, we will focus on the southern Darwin frog, but many things are similar between the two. The frogs were, of course, named for Charles Darwin himself, who discovered them on his world voyage in 1834, where his knowledge from that trip helped set up many of his thoughts and ideas of how the natural world works. The Darwin's frog can be found in temperate and tropical rainforests found in slow-moving streams and swamps within these areas. They can also be found as high up in elevations of 3,600 feet or about 1,097 meters. They can grow up to 0.98 to 1.38 inches or about 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters in length and weigh a whopping 0.07 to 0.17 ounces or 2 to 5 grams with a lifespan of about 10 to 15 years. As far as what they look like, they have about a triangle shaped head with a somewhat long snout. They are stubby looking frogs, but with their main outline of the Doran's frog in a shape of a leaf which of course is for camouflage. The colors of this frog vary based on the type of substrate they are found on, because within the different regions, there are different colored plants, so different colored leaves and soil. So matching what's around you is pretty important. But the colors of the Darwin's frog can vary between brown to bright green, while their underside is a little more brightly colored with black background that has big white spots on it, which also can be accompanied with smaller yellow and orange spots as well. Now, the Darwin's frog in the region are actually nicknamed the cowboy frog. Yeehaw! For a couple different reasons. For one, the black and white spots make them kind of look like they have a cow pattern on their bellies. In addition, they actually have these little spur-looking appendages on their legs, kind of sort of where a cowboy spur would be on his boot. And lastly, they are nicknamed the cowboy frog for the fact that the Darwin's frog's call sounds a little like a cowboy whistling for his cattle to come in. 
Now, these are really cool looking frogs, and I do suggest checking them out on the old Google machine, for they have a lot of interesting details on them, all just to confuse a potential predator, which can include a wide variety of snakes, birds, and small mammals, even including such things as rats. These guys are a very small frog, so they pretty much can make a very yummy little frog gusher snack to a lot of different animals. Thankfully, that's why it has created such great camouflage. Its camo helps make it look like a dead leaf on the forest floor. Or they may even jump into a river or creek nearby if they sense a predator and will lay completely still, putting on an Oscar-winning performance of acting like a leaf floating down the creek. A brilliant plan for hiding in plain sight, plus bonus having a way to get away from the predator quickly and quietly thanks to the moving water. While in the water, it helps to have a certain set of things that can help you survive this Oscar-winning performance. For one, their eyes and nostrils are positioned higher on their heads to keep their bodies in a more believable dead leaf position while still being able to, you know, see and breathe as they float away. Another tactic, if being a leaf is a bust, is they may even flip themselves over and play dead. This helps also show off their colorful underbellies as well, which hopefully will freak out any potential predator for two reasons. One, it's really weird if all of a sudden your food just flips over and dies. Even in the animal world, that would make you question if it's safe to eat it or not. And secondly, all those colors on its belly. For many other frogs in this region, we'll use colors as a warning to predators that, hey man, I'm toxic, so I wouldn't eat me if I was you, just saying, so okay, bye, have a nice day. But yeah, so for example, poison dart frogs, that's why they are so colorful, because they don't need to hide, because a predator would be a pretty big idiot if they ate a poison dart frog, because, well, they're poisonous. Also, fun side fact about poison dart frogs, they aren't actually poisonous under human care because in the wild, they are poisonous from the ants that they eat, who are poisonous from the plants that they eat. It's sort of like a whisper down the lane, but with poison because, hey, you are what you eat. But don't worry for the Darwin's frog, for if a predator still wants to eat them since, well, they are no dart frog and they can be eaten... Their final hope is that they will run, or I guess hop in this case, away. They have very strong, powerful legs and webbed back legs, perfect for a quick swim or hop away. Now, they are a smaller frog species, but they still have been clocked in on being able to hop away at about 5 miles per hour or 8.05 kilometers an hour, which may not seem very fast, but at the size that they are, they are the flash of the tiny frog world. But the Darwin frog is not just fast, it is also patient, which is how it catches its prey. Because like many other frog species, the Darwin frog will sit silently and still, for they are an ambush predator. And being an ambush predator that also looks like a leaf is pretty helpful. Waiting for things like a passing insect, spider, snail, or even a worm to come down its path, just simply going about their day, and then, bam! Quick as a flash, out pops the Darwin's frog tongue, and it's lunchtime. Which may actually happen during our actual lunchtime, because to these speedsters, you don't even have to wait for the cover of night to spot them. Because they are so quick and have such good camouflage, these little frogs feel comfortable enough to be awake during the daytime. Now, as amazing as all this sounds, the Darwin's frog's truly most unique facts come from its reproduction cycle. The breeding season starts in November through March, where the males will start to sing its cowboy whistle song to attract a mate. Once a female does show up, she will then pair off with the male, who will then lead her to a nice sheltered area where they can start their courtship ritual. How romantic. He will amplex her, which is a fancy biology word for basically him getting on her, grabbing her armpits, and breeding with her, which normally involves him also fertilizing her eggs as she lays them outside her body, which is a form of external reproduction. She can lay up to 30 to 40 eggs in moist decomposing leaves and vegetation on the forest floor. Next, unlike many other frog species where the male and the female will breed with each other and then ditch the eggs, the father will actually stay behind to guard the eggs. 
which means unlike many other frog species who breed with multiple females during the year, most of the time the Darwin's frog will just breed with one, making the Darwin's frog father of the year when it comes to frogs at least. The female, however, is done with her duties and heads out and gets on with her life. The male will stand guard over his eggs for about three weeks. Then, when the first sign of tadpoles start to appear in the clear eggs, the male will do the unthinkable. He will start to swallow the eggs with the tadpoles in them. And no, he's not eating them, as many may think, but he's actually protecting them. For the males have these specialized vocal cords that actually act as tadpole nurseries, which explains why... When looking at the anatomy of a Darwin frog, even though they have these huge vocal cords, they only produce a tiny high-pitched call instead of a big booming call you would expect from that of like a bullfrog. The male Darwin frog can actually hold up to 19 eggs in his vocal cords, where the eggs will then hatch, develop, and become little froglets while all living in their father's throat. If you're wondering how the tadpoles can survive when the tadpoles first hatch, they will eat their egg they hatch from, followed by any additional eggs that don't finish developing. After that, they will get all their nutrients they ever need from the nutrient-rich secretion the males produce in their vocal cords to help feed the growing tadpoles inside. It will eat that secretion up until it grows its back legs fully. Then at that point, it will start to absorb its tail and finish growing out its front legs and anything else it will need to become a tiny version of an adult Darwin frog. This process from the father swallowing the eggs till the froglets are ready to leave can take about 50 to 70 days, which is a long time to have not just one frog, but 19 frogs in your throat. When the froglets are ready to leave, The father will then do the only thing you can do when you want to get rid of a frog in your throat, by hacking it out. The male will pretty much give birth to his kids by spitting them out, and as soon as they are out, they are pretty much on their own, and the father's duty is finally done. Mouth brooding, as this technique is called, seems pretty weird method of taking care of kids especially since the female only lays up to 40 eggs, but the male can only carry 19. But with this parenting strategy, they gain the upper hand in their life, for when the male swallows his young, the chances are great for all 19 eggs to become froglets, which 19 out of 40 is better odds than most frogs get, where most frogs would be lucky if one out of a thousand eggs they laid ever become a froglet, which is great because Darwin frogs have such a success rate because, well, we need more Darwin frogs. Both species, the northern and the southern species, are under major threats, and many other mouth-brooding frogs and toads around the world have went extinct or about to be, and the Darwin frog, unfortunately, is no exception. The northern Darwin frog hasn't been seen in the wild, actually, since 1980 and believed to be extinct in the wild while the southern Darwin's frog is not far behind. The southern Darwin frog is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN red list population, decreasing. One of the main reasons for the decline is chytrid fungus, a deadly fungus that was introduced by humans by bringing old world frogs like the African clawed frog over to the new world. The African clawed frog was a very popular cheap pet as well as popular to be used in laboratories. The fungus on these frogs got out and had many possible ways of doing so. Really, just possibly pouring an infected frog's water down the sink could have released it into the wilderness. Chytrid is an old world fungus, which old world amphibians like the African clawed frog are used to having and know how to deal with. Chytrid introduced to the new world amphibians that call the new world home have no defenses to deal with this fungus. Chytrid is so dangerous to amphibians of the New World that some frog and toad species have went extinct from chytrid in a matter of months. A fungus that is nature made, but because of people went to places it never should have. The other contributions to the decline of the Darwin's frog population is of course global climate change and habitat destruction. Due to illegal farming where the farmers will just let their cows graze wherever, killing off all the native plants, 
or illegal logging where they're destroying and devastating the forest that the Darwin frog calls home. But what happens after the trees are cut down is what I really want to talk to you about today. Because all this once temperate forest that has been cleared out is not filling up with native plants, but invasive ones. And these invasive plants are changing the landscape forever. A variety of invasive pine trees and eucalyptus have taken over the forests of Chile and Argentina. Now, invasive plants are species of plants that are not naturally found in this region and are brought in by humans, whether it was for agricultural reasons or just simply people trying to put non-native plants in their own backyard. But no matter the case, what normally ends up happening is those non-native plants or invasive plants get away from the human areas and start taking over the wildlife. Plants that can outcompete native plants due to them not having animals and other plants in this region that can either eat or compete with them. Many times these invasive plants grow quicker and spread faster than that of the native plants. This is because plants vs. animals and plants vs. plants in native ranges find defenses against each other. Plants learn how to compete with other plants through things like growing faster, taking nutrients away from each other, or even changing the chemistry of the soil so other plants have harder times growing there. While for animals, many plants put up defenses so animals won't eat them, especially if they're younger plants and just starting out. But native animals and plants always had the chance to, when a plant evolved a new system of defense, to then figure out a way to evolve to compete with them. But when you have plants out of the native range going up against plants and animals that have not spent millions of years learning how to deal with their little tricks and (laughs) different ways of defending or taking advantage of each other, well, those plants can outcompete the natives. Now, plants in general are great because they help change CO2 to oxygen and store carbon, which we desperately need in this world. But at the end of the day, that little bit that that invasive plant does doesn't make up for all the bad that invasive plant species can do. Invasive species of plants can change the ecosystem to something that is no longer suitable for the native wildlife to live. Now, this may be a weird concept, but Truly, just because you see a bunch of trees around, what looks like a forest doesn't mean it's a healthy ecosystem. Many human-caused forests are complete dead zones to native wildlife and are just full of one or two types of trees. You might as well have an empty grass field there. The pines can even change the chemistry of the forest floor and change the hydration and the soil can retain. The pine needles as they fall can create areas that are not as usable by other ground cover plants due to the tannins that these pine tree needles leach in the soil, leaving space for normally only other pine trees of the same species to emerge. In addition, because of the less ground cover, droughts in this area have become worse, as well as the additional drought issue around the world, which are not helpful especially since many invasive pine trees being able to survive better than even native pine trees in this kind of condition. So, what can we do? Well, for one, at your own home, obviously help out with more environmentally friendly practices. Conserving fresh water is a big one. Take shorter showers, be mindful about cleaning dishes, all that kind of stuff can really help out with water shortage problems which are, of course, all mainly due to human use. But also, global climate change is changing rain patterns, so water is not getting to certain areas like it used to. So helping out with conservation and water conservation can really help out this little frog, even if you're across the globe. Another is to ensure you are getting wood for projects from conservationly minded places. It's not like the logging in Chile isn't being affected by the rest of the world. There are a number of companies that do work with nature. However, there are plenty of others that will clear-cut native forests to sell fancy exotic wood to you for your cabinets in your kitchen. Or in other cases, there are some companies that purposely clear-cut a forest to then create an unnatural invasive forest with faster-growing trees that they then can 
more regularly cut down to logs since those trees are easier to grow and quicker. So much more money in it for them. The biggest thing for this frog, however, is help from its own country. The countries that the Darwin's frog is found in does need better land management to help ensure the protection of its native forest. The areas that this frog is found in are even considered species hotspots due to the immense richness of different unique life found there. So it's not just the Darwin frog that's in trouble, many species are. And luckily and unluckily, the Darwin frog is found in these forests for this frog has actually become a symbol in these regions to save the forest. Kind of like the golden lion tamarind of Brazil or the giant pandas in China, the Darwin's frog has become the poster child of conservation for the forest on this region. Putting a face that is unique and rare and shows how amazing this piece of land is, even compared to the rest of the world, can really draw up local interest. To fire up the people not to just save one species, but all of the species in this region. And it can all be thanks to the father of the year, the Darwin's frog. And that's our show. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the Darwin's frog, a unique, amazing frog named for a unique, interesting guy. As always, make sure to check out my social media accounts at Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And of course, if you don't like those, you can always contact me through my email at ericlikesanimals at gmail.com. Info on this can be found down below in the episode footer. And once again, thank you guys so much for listening. And just remember, next time you have a frog in your throat and getting a little annoyed by it, don't forget, it could be a lot worse. You could have 19 frogs in your throats. Now, wouldn't that suck?